In this video, we'll be looking at evolutionary psychology in the context of offspring care. So first of all, the context. Humans are unusual among animals in the very high amount of parental care we provide to our offspring. Females clearly spend a lot of energy producing uh, the baby, nine months, and the milk. But males do provide resources to the offspring and the female in terms of food, shelter, safety, and childcare. So in fact, in humans, unlike many other animals, both males and females make very, very large investments in the offspring. And neither male nor female can be totally secure about the investment they're making, right? So in fact, males have no guarantee that an offspring they're caring for is theirs. And females, when they mate with a male, they have no guarantee that the male will stay and provide these resources. So in a sense, both males and females are taking a chance when they reproduce with another individual. And so if we think about the different sorts of chances that they're taking, a number of different comparative studies are consistent with these generating different priorities. So when we study jealousy, females tend to focus on the appearance of rival females, perhaps because that's associated with males leaving and reproducing with them. Males focus more on the social status of rivals in terms of maybe which males might be able to be a provider and therefore be preferred by their female. And when we think about infidelity, studies show that females are often more concerned about emotional infidelity than sexual, relative to males who tend to be more concerned about sexual infidelity than emotional. And again, this fits with priorities that come from this. Since males are more concerned about parentage, this compromises parentage. This is what has to do with uh, risk of leaving. That's less of a risk for males, that the females would leave without providing resources. Versus for females, sexual infidelity doesn't reduce the female fitness as much as emotional infidelity that might lead to the male leaving and providing for some other individuals. Again, this isn't proof, but it's consistent that these different challenges here that males and females face actually match up very well with the different opinions that males and females have about these sorts of issues. A really interesting example of this sort of males don't have a guarantee about the offspring is a study um, from 2007. So if we think about eye color, blue eye color is recessive. So you have to be homozygous to have a blue eyes. And that means that if a male has blue eyes and he mates with a female that has blue eyes, then their offspring should all have blue eyes, and so that male can guarantee the paternity of his offspring if he selects a female that has blue eyes. On the other hand, if a blue-eyed male mates with a brown-eyed female, the offspring would be mixed. They could be blue and brown if this female is a heterozygote, or they could be all brown if the female is a homozygote. And in that case, that male would not know whether that female mated with him or maybe mated with some brown-eyed male, right? And that's why the offspring are brown. On the other hand here, the male would know for sure if the female mated with a brown-eyed male because then some of the offspring wouldn't be blue. So this argument here, I can think of this as like a very primitive genetic test of parentage, has been argued should lead to selection within blue-eyed males that they should prefer blue-eyed females, which is actually what this study shows. So otherwise, there's not really a reason why we would expect blue-eyed males to prefer blue-eyed females more than brown-eyed males prefer blue-eyed females. Again, these sorts of correlation studies are not proof, but they are consistent with these evolutionary arguments and hypotheses. It's not proof, but it's evidence that supports. Here's another hypothesis. Females historically rely on males for resources, so females should therefore prefer males that have resources so they can do this provision. Note also that those resources may indicate genetic quality, and so that's a nice idea. I mean, it sounds good, but how would we test this idea that females are maybe going for males with resources? The first thing here is we can see this very strong cross-cultural pattern that females prefer males with resources, so you can just go and measure it, and it's across all the cultures. And a proxy for this is that gaining resources takes time, and it often tends to be older males that actually have these resources, right? So in human society, you don't start off rich, you have to work and get rich after a while, or at least historically it was that way. 
And so this preference for males with resources, this leads to a preference where females are selected to prefer older males. And we saw earlier that males are selected to prefer younger females for the most part, unless they themselves are very young. So we have this interesting phenomenon here where females prefer older, males prefer younger, and actually that's complementary, but is that related to fitness? So here's an interesting study. This is based on differences in age of parents and the number of offspring in Sweden. So what we're plotting on this axis is the number of offspring that married couples had. On this axis is the age difference between the male and the female. So this is data for men. If the female, if their wife was older than them versus if their wife was younger than them, males with younger wives had more offspring than males with older wives. So it's not just a cultural preference, it's actually a fitness difference. Males maximize their fitness by having partners that were six years younger than them. So we actually see a fitness benefit to this preference. This is the data for the females. So this axis is offspring count. This axis, again, is if the male is older than the female. This is if the male is younger than the female. Females, if their male was older, had more offspring than they would if their male was younger. So the same sort of thing, and here the peak is at about four years. So females maximize their fitness by mating with a male who is four years older. Males maximize their fitness by mating with a female who is six years younger. And so you have this complement where maybe a five-year age difference is optimal, kind of total. And you see an age discrepancy or age difference when you look at couples. You actually generally do see males older than females. And in fact, maybe because it's good for both of their fitnesses. Changing topics a little bit, another hypothesis. An individual's fitness is not increased by spending resources on a non-biological child. So you might expect them to provide less care to adopted children. And this is more of a problem for males, right? So since females give birth, they typically would know if the children are theirs. Historically, males, when their partner has a baby, they wouldn't be guaranteed that that baby was theirs, right? So for most of human history, paternity couldn't be guaranteed with a, with a test or something. So this is kind of a challenge more for males than for females. So this sounds like a, a good idea, right? So maybe males would be expected to provide less care to adopted children than, than their biological children or something like this. But how would we test this sort of preference? Well, it turns out there is a thing called the Cinderella effect in society. So the Cinderella effect is getting at whether parental care for biological and adopted children differ. So the Cinderella effect is the observation that in, for example, Canada, the murder rate for children under five, so this is how often these kids are getting murdered, by their biological father, 2.6 per million child years, by a stepfather, 321 per million years. So kids are 120 times more likely to be killed by a stepfather than by a biological father. And kids are just as annoying in both cases and maybe motivating adults to kill them. So this discrepancy is really driven by biology. Studies in other countries show the same sort of thing, that basically individuals are over 100 times more likely to kill an adopted child than they are to kill a biological child. And again, the, all the conscious reasons and conscious ramifications and conscious costs are very similar, right? The children are of similar ages. You go to jail for the same amount of time for killing a biological and a non-biological kid. You compromise the relationship with your female partner, uh, whether it's your kid or someone else's kid, right? Because in both cases, it would be their kid. So the conscious reasons for killing would seem to be very similar, certainly not a hundredfold discrepancy. On the other hand, from a fitness point of view, there's a huge discrepancy, right? Because adopted kids contribute zero fitness to a father versus biological. So this is kind of an unfortunate fact about society that is in fact explained by evolutionary psychology selecting for something in the male brain that 
causes them to be much less willing to provide care to non-biological children as opposed to biological ones. Here's another hypothesis. If an individual's offspring differ in their quality, so say a parent had multiple children or something, extra resources should be provided to those that have the best chance to produce their own offspring. If we're thinking about fitness as being increased by maximizing the number of grandchildren, if an individual has multiple offspring and some of them look like they may be successful and some of them look like they won't be successful at all, maybe it's better to put resources into the ones that are most likely to be successful That'll give you your best increase in the number of grandchildren. So again, this is an idea, it's a hypothesis. How do we test that? We're going to test that by looking at kids in grocery carts in grocery stores. To the extent that sexual selection occurs in humans, more attractive kids would be expected to have more offspring, right? More attractive people have more kids. And so if we think about this rationale, more care should be given to attractive kids because they'd be more likely to generate grandkids. So what was done is the Researchers watched people in grocery stores that had children and they measured the attractiveness of the kids. So they had one person come in and rate the kids' cuteness or attractiveness. And then a separate person measured attentiveness, how much care the parent was giving to the child. And that was measured by how often they were seat belted into the cart versus not seat belted. Right? Seat belting shows care because it shows you're more concerned about the safety of the kid. And they measured how often the kid was allowed to wander off away from the parent versus how often the parent prevented the kid from potentially wandering into danger. And so the data here, if we look at the rate of cart seatbelt use, this is if the caretaker was female or male. Cute kids were given seatbelts a lot more than ugly kids, by the females and by the males. And uglier kids were allowed to wander more than 10 feet away a lot more often. And so this was a lot of kids observed over a lot of stores in Canada. Unfortunately, it's not a scientific paper. It was done by a scientific researcher who studies public safety, and he actually studies seatbelt use. So there's actually a description of the study in the New York Times. But we see a clear pattern where the more attractive kids are the ones that are getting taken care of more than the ugly kids, which fits this hypothesis. Again, it doesn't prove this hypothesis, but is data that supports this hypothesis and is hard to explain without some other hypothesis, maybe about how we like, maybe don't want um, ugly kids to survive or something like that, but that's a bit cynical. So there are other more speculative evolutionary psychology hypotheses, things that people have thrown out that, for which there's not so many good studies. So perhaps sexual selection for older males, which we mentioned earlier, has actually led to our unusually long lifespan. Humans live much longer than other organisms our size. Maybe it's because of selection that has increased reproduction in males when they are old, and that's similar to that Drosophila selection for old age experiment, right? When the females were selected to reproduce late in age, the lifespan of those Drosophila increased. Maybe that's true in humans as well. Can display behavior like these bowerbirds in males explain observed discrepancy in creative artistic musical abilities um, between the genders, right? So over most of history, the quote-unquote great musicians or flamboyant musicians or very noticeable ones have been males and females don't appear to have done that as often. Now, of course, there's lots of cultural factors and other biases that can account for some of that, which is what, part of what makes this very speculative, but maybe selection to basically be a bright, colorful, flamboyant member of the male sex has led to males being hardwired to do that more often. Maybe, maybe not. And perhaps selection like this can explain why women go for the kind of the bad guy or the confident or dominant male, because maybe that's indicative of genetic quality, right? So here's a couple males for her to choose from. Um, at the beginning, she doesn't know uh, that she's related to one of them. She clearly prefers this one, who is clearly not a stable partner because he's a criminal after all. And there's all sorts of stereotypes about females having a preference for males that objectively would not be good but maybe it's because of a history of selection for males that are dominant or have higher social status, which is maybe acquired by being more aggressive, for example. So again, these are like more speculative things. And if you look at evolutionary psychology studies, many of them actually don't go much past this. If you look at description of evolutionary psychology in the news media, almost none of those go past this. So, Although throughout these lectures we've seen a number of studies, when you hear about each hypothesis being tested, 
the degree to which you want to feel that hypothesis is supported should come from the quality of the study and they widely range in their quality so it's kind of buyer beware when we think about evolutionary psychology because it's so easy to make up kind of hypotheses about anything this field is particularly prone to having this just so story issue as you go forward into the the rest of your endeavors just keep this in mind for the future